Last time uh, we talked about decision versus optimization. We said that uh, deciding whether some condition is true or not, it's about as easy or as hard as actually finding a solution for that condition or that condition. So, for example, determining whether a Boolean formula is satisfiable is as easy or as hard as actually finding a satisfying assignment. And that situation, counterintuitive though it is, because you would know, think it's harder to find a solution than just determine whether a solution exists for something. That situation uh, is uh, occurring because, in general, you can play 21 questions with a decider, and thereby turn it into an optimizer. Right, just like you ask me 21 questions about which animal I'm thinking about, I'm not going to tell you the animal. Eventually, you'll know it's a zebra if you ask me enough question. And that's true in general. So that induces the class NP, basically. Class NP can be alternatively characterized as a class of problems for which you can um, um, prove that an answer exists. Okay, so never mind finding it. It's a 21 question. So, just so you don't see NP in isolation, I'm showing you a whole bunch of other complexity classes around NP, inside NP, outside of NP, just so you can see some of the landscape around it, computationally speaking. So you know, here's the class of polynomial time, deterministic polynomial time solving the problem. That's P. So for example, you can determine whether strings have this form. You can test for formality in the linear programming. A lot of things can do in P. The NP is right outside it, and as the NP-complete problem is, P and NP could be the same, but we don't know. This is a Venn diagram. This is a set containment diagram. So these, all those represent sets and subsets. These subsets are not solely proper subsets. So in the case of P and NP, we know that P is contained in NP. We don't know if they're equal or not. But for example, in P versus X time, exponential time, so polynomial time and exponential time, we know that they're not the same. So some subsets here, shown in this Venn diagram's containments, are proper subsets. Otherwise, other ones, we know they're not proper subsets. Uh, so, some we, 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 we have open questions about. We don't know if they're proper or not um, contained, properly contained in other subsets. So a lot of open questions in this diagram that you're staring at. All right, so here's polynomial space. Polynomial space could be equal to P, to polynomial time. We don't know. It's not likely. Because that's even a bigger class than NP. We don't even know if P and NP are the same, much less P and P space are the same. Because if P, polynomial time, polynomial space are the same, NP that's sandwiched between them would be equal to all three. And that will solve that open problem. So, so there's a lot of open problems here. Exponential time we know is not the same as polynomial time. The space and time hierarchy theorems, which we're not going to go into in this class, but in a theory class, we would go into them and improve them. 
uh, the space and time hierarchy theorem is basically saying that if you have enough more space or enough more time, you can solve more problems, provably so. The complexity classes are not the same. Let's just leave it at that. And then, of course, the things are decidable within any finite time. And there are things that are undecidable because no finite time will suffice because there's no algorithm for that. Like the holding problem, we already proved that way earlier, of course. The holding problem has no algorithm, no matter how inefficient. Some problems are so hard to compute, not only they'll take enormous amounts of time, it's worse than that, but no time will suffice because there's no algorithm for that. The things can get worse and worse and worse, and there are things that are even worse than that. I can show that our problems are undecidable. Even if you can solve the whole big problem in constant time, which there's no algorithm for it, in any time, even if you can solve the constant, the whole, the whole big problem in constant time, you can mathematically prove that if you had such a subroutine and solve the whole big problem in constant time, there are still problems hard, so hard that even if you're using that whole big problem in constant time solution as a subroutine, you still can't solve the other problems. So they're even more undecidable than the holding problem. So the whole infinite hierarchy of undecidable problems, some of which are more undecidable than others. This is an interesting concept. So we're saying some things are impossible, but other things are even more impossible than that. In what sense? That even if you do this first impossible thing, freely, at no cost, instantly, you still couldn't do the second impossible thing with an arbitrary number of holes to the first subroutine that solved that impossible thing. Very mathematically precise statement. So there's degrees of impossibility, amazingly enough. How do you do that? My gift to you. Read about it. Extra credit. Tell me what you learned. Read the PDF. Okay, any questions about this this map? This is kind of a, the Venn diagram is also kind of a map of the landscape of certain flexible classes that we know and love, including PNNT right here, but there's lots of other ones. Just for the record, context-free languages are in here. They're a subset, proper subset of P. Context-free languages are languages like palindromes, recognizing palindromes. You can do it in the stack. You can't do it in the final sum of the order. And there's a deterministic context-free languages. There's regular languages that are made of regular expressions. Those you all know, know and love. We use them all the time. Regular expressions, they're a proper subset of P, the regular languages. And of course, there's finite languages, and there's infinite hierarchies between these classes. Just so you don't think that this map is all there is. I'm just showing you the most common couple of dozen complexity classes here, but there's literally hundreds and hundreds of complexity classes that are known and named. They have special names because we study them all the time, of which P and NP are just two of these hundreds. And I'm just showing you a few dozen. And there's an infinite number of classes in between these infinite hierarchies. So I'm kind of showing you them diagrammatically in purple and in red kind of bullseyes kind of notation there. Just so you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that this slide is too small to contain. Otherwise, we get really messy. And in the theory class and the question class, you know, we go into a lot of these other classes of uh, problems and types of uh, complexity classes and the relationships and the non-relationships and containments and so on. Okay, but back down to P and MP. At least one you should at least once you should see the bigger picture, so that's why I showed you this slide. Um, so we talked about graph cliques. You know, we said it could convert satisfiability in particular three sac to a graph clique problem such in such a way that uh, the resulting graph has a uh, clique if and only if the original uh, formula that induced that graph as a satisfying assignment. So you reduce the problem of satisfiability with a graph of clique, graph cliques. And independent set, similar reduction. Uh, we know that independent set is the opposite the antithesis of a, of a, of a clique, an anti-clique. Right? An independent set, no two nodes in that independent set have an edge between them. The clique is the other way. All pairs of nodes have edges between them. And you can convert one to the other. So you can take an independent set solver and convert it to a graph clique solver simply by negating the graph, by inverting the graph, convert edges and non-edges, and then call the independent set solver that gives you an independent set, and you know that the original graph is So that's an easy transformation. Uh, how, how do you get that one? Right? 
talked about it last time, just to remind you. Okay. Um, graph tolerability is true where we left off last time. We said you can take an instance of 3SAT and each clause becomes this kind of graph piece or graph, graph construct called a gadget in such a way that this gadget is three colorable if and only if that original clause is satisfied or it's true in the original formula. So you can take an arbitrary instance of 3SAT and convert it to this big graph in such a way that this graph is three colorable if and only if the three set instance is satisfiable. And so once you have a coloring of this graph that looks like, say, this, so the answer may not be unique, you can just read off from the colors what the assignment is. X is true, Y is false, Z is false, and so on. And it gives you a satisfying assignment, and you want to check it, and that's how you reduce satisfiability to graph coloring instance. Bottom line is, if you have a solver for graph colorability, even just three colorability, not any old colorability, it's even more general, graph three colorability, if three color colors suffice, this construction will enable you to solve arbitrary SAT instances in polynomial time, assuming that the graph colorability subroutine works in polynomial time. Because this transformation is polynomial. In fact, it's not just any old polynomial. How fast is this transformation? Converting the original SAT instance into this graph. Big O notation. Let's say you have, a, you have a formula of size n. There's n variables and negations of variables. And, and generally, there's n, n you know, literals in the formula. How big is the graph in the, as a function of the formula? The, the formula size being n. It's big O of what? Of the y of this. How many say n linear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the rest of you have not been? Okay. That's okay. Uh, why? Because every every clause ends up as a small fixed piece of the graph. And, you know, roughly what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine at most you know, nodes, or the way it takes. Uh, so it's a linear transformation. Even if it was quadratic, it'd still be okay. Even if it was degree 17, it'd still be okay. But you have to be linear as well as you can observe that. Okay, so you might ask, what makes colorability difficult? You know, why is it so hard to paint the nodes of a graph in such a way that no two neighboring nodes share the same color? I mean, it sounds pretty innocent, that right? straightforward kind of task. You know, what makes it so hard that humanity doesn't know of a polynomial time algorithm for yet or or ever? I mean, it's, uh, and you might say, okay, you know. Uh, here are some graphs, so you three color these graphs. You know, why, is it, why is it so difficult? Uh, is it the high degree, perhaps? You know, what if we restrict the degree of the graph to some low degree? Maybe it's nodes of this kind that have degree 6 or 10 or degree 100. Those can have arbitrary degree in a lot of graphs. Maybe it's a degree that's the problem. And so we try to reduce the problem, simplify it, and see how hard it remains if you say lower the degree. The answer is no. Graph colorability is hard even for max degree four graphs. But it's easy for less de lesser degrees. So if you say if the maximum degree of a graph is zero, colorability is real easy. If I ask you if a graph of degree max zero is say three colorable, how hard would it be for you to determine that it is or isn't <coughs> degree zero? It's always three colorable. In fact, it's always two colorable. In fact, it's always one colorable, right? Because there's no edges. In degree zero, there's no edges at all. So you see, if you reduce the degree enough, it becomes a trivial problem. Nothing hard about it. Okay. Um, what about degree one graph? I'll give you a degree one graph. Maximum degree one. Maybe some of those that have degree zero, other those that have degree one. And I ask you, is it three colorable? I mean, you say there's a simple algorithm for it. Yeah, what's that simple algorithm? If I say a degree one mass, max degree one graph, is to be colorable, yes or no? What's your algorithm? I'm going to give you a hint. It's, it's, it's one line long, one line of code. Of 
So, so the question is a yes or no question. It's a Boolean query. So I give you a graph that's degree max one degree maximum. Every other degree at most one. The question is, the yes, no question to you is, is it three colorable? Your algorithm is what? Return true. How many get that? Yeah, very simple, one line. Return true, and you'll be right. You'll be right all the time. The question is about that. It's so easy, it's almost hard to do it. All right, if I say a degree max one graph, is it two colorable? Yes, obviously the answer is the same, algorithm is the same as before. Okay. Degree one max graph, is it one colorable? Now it's not so, not as trivial. You have to check for what? If there are any edges. If there are any edges, it's two colorable, but not one color. So, so the other one is slightly more complicated than trivial. Than trivial before true and what if I give you degree max four graph? I ask is a three color book. What's your algorithm then? If time wasn't an issue, you can use all the time you want. What's an algorithm then? Simple algorithm to tell me if the degree max four graph is three color book. Try everything. Brute force. Brute force is always a trivial algorithm that works if you don't care what about the time, but the what's the how long it takes. But if I ask you, is there a polynomial time algorithm for this? Nobody knows. That's not the question. It's been open for 50 years. It's equal to P is equal to N. Equivalent question. So things get subtle very, very quickly. Zero is trivial, one was trivial, two. And then it's NP complete for four, max degree four. And by the way, what about max degree two? We haven't, we haven't talked about that specifically. If I say if a graph has max degree two, is it three colorable? I would say yeah, it's always three colorable. Yeah, why? Max degree two. Why is it always three colorable? No exception. Not completely on it, yeah. Yeah, we're getting to that. Yeah, that's 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 a deeper dive than I intend right now, but uh, if max degree two, Thomas Planer and four colors will suffice. True statement. But I ask, is it three colors, not four colors? Yeah, but you're right, and we'll get to that in a minute. So again, if the graph has max of E2, is a three color. <coughs> Let me say, yeah, it's always three color, but max of E2. Let me say, no, exceptions. Okay, so I already said, yeah, it's three color, but why? What do graphs of max of E2 look like? What's their structure in general? Where it says if the maximum is zero, it's just isolated numbers. If the maximum is at most one, it's what? Isolated nodes or pairs of nodes. Yeah. Could you have three nodes connected up together and then maximum be one? No. You don't make one of them between two. But maximum two graphs, what do they look like? What's their structure? Obviously, I could have isolated nodes. You can have pairs of nodes. You can have cycles. Let me see that. Cycles. Or long chains. Can you have anything other than isolated nodes? Pairs, chains, and cycles? Right. A pair is actually a chain. Size one or two. Can, you have, can you have other things in a max degree two graph other than isolated nodes, chains, and cycles? Let me say, yeah, you can have something else. I said, no, that covers it. Yeah, that covers it. Can you paint all these things with three colors at most? Cycles, chains, and isolated nodes? And so, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Why wouldn't it take more than three to paint, say, a chain? How many colors would it take to paint a chain? Two. A cycle? Three. At most three. 
or two, but it most three. Why three? What cycles take a third color? Odd, odd cycles. So a max degree two graph requires three colors at most, and the only cases it does require three colors is when it has odd cycles. It's a different only. That's a fair. And we just prove it. So your algorithm is very simple to determine if it max to me two graph requires three colors. The answer is always yes. If it requires only two colors, the answer is a little more complicated. You gotta check for odd cycles. How do you get this algorithm? Okay. So you see, you reduce the degree enough and it becomes trivial, or not quite completely trivial, but still pretty straightforward. You keep the degree four, and that's empty completeness in full bloom. It just blossoms into arbitrary complexity, not known to be in the regular time. That's the threshold. I'll leave up to you what happens with degree three. I left it out for extra credit. Tell me what the situation is with degree three. Is it for a normal time solvable? Or is that already also empty complete? But now, we're going to show that graph three colorability is empty complete for these maximum degree four graphs. So solving maximum degree four colorability is as hard as solving arbitrary colorability of any degree, which is very interesting. It's kind of unexpected. If you reduce it enough, you trivialize it. So sometimes you look for the threshold of complexity, but complexity rears its ugly head and metastasizes it. The full moon complexity from straightforward polynomial time. And for degrees, that is a four for colorability. For other problems, it happens in other thresholds. It's interesting to explore where the problem just explodes into full really complexity of very high order, possibly exponential time, where this explosion occurs. It illuminates the nature of these problems. Okay, so we're about to prove the degree four max graphs. Uh, it's empty complete to four, to, to, three, to three color. Whether, whether there's even a three color. Here's the proof. So we're going to use a gadget that looks like this. This gadget has several properties uh, that are important to us here. So they, first of all, it has maximum degree 4. How do we know? Because you can just look and see that the degree is never more than 4 anywhere in this gadget. In some places, it's even less than that. So the degree is 4 in these circles, and here the degree is 2. Uh, the gadget is 3 colorable, but it's not 2 colorable. Why is it three colorable? Because here's a three coloring of it. That's a three coloring of it, it's a valid coloring. So why is it not two colorable? Well, there's a triangle. We know that no triangle is three colors, because that's an odd cycle. Odd cycles require you know, an extra color, two more, two more surprises. Okay, that's the second property. The third property, in all three colorings that you come up with, the corners get the same color. So that corner, and that corner, and that corner, well, these three corners will all get the color blue. There's nothing magic about blue. It could be green, it could be red, but all three corners will necessarily have the same color. That requires a bit of a proof. So uh, there's this kind of three color ability constraint propagation that works like this. If you have a diamond shaped subgraph that looks like this, just four nodes connected like a diamond, opposite corners will have the same color. Why? Because once you paint this to the first color, this has to be the second color, that has to be the third color, and that guy below has to be the first color again, the same as what you started with. I'm going to get that. So it's unavoidable. So opposite corners of the diamond must have the same color in any valid three coloring of the graph that contains that diamond shape. Not just the diamond shape itself, the entire graph, once you three color it, each diamond in it must have this property. Because it's colorability constraints. So this constrains this and that. Both of these constrain this, and both of these constrain that, and that must be the same color as the first. It also has to be red. The two ends could be blue, or the two ends could be green. Colors are interchangeable. You don't have to call them red, blue, and green. Call them one, two, and three. You call them alpha, beta, and gamma. You got to call them Larry, Moe, and Curly. It doesn't matter what you call them, as long as you call them something. Yeah. So, uh, given this propagation constraint, Whatever the middle node is, notice there's a diamond here. This diamond here is the same as that. So whatever that node is, its color will be the same as that corner. How many can see that? It doesn't matter which way it's oriented. 
colors propagate at one right? And same here, there's a diamond here. So this color propagates here, and there's, once you do that, these other ones are determined, right? There's a triangle here, so both of these must be opposite colors. So without also generality, because it's symmetric, we'll make them blue and green, not red. Once you do that, these other ones are determined. Because this has a blue neighbor, this has a red neighbor, so this must be green too. And this must be green too. That's this red arrow showing you how the constraints, the color of the constraints are propagated out to other nodes by their neighbors. Once you do that, these two impose the blue color on this node. Once you do that, these two nodes impose the red color on that node, and all three corners, therefore, must be the same color. How do you get this proof? It's a proof. It's a lemma, really. Uh, lemmas are just short things. And the way the bigger things. Okay, so this proves the third property. In any three coloring, all corners get the same color red, red, and red. So now we're going to take these gadgets and duplicate them and connect them up into larger gadgets. So we'll take this gadget here that we can three color and duplicate it and connect them by the end, connect them by the corner. So now we have a bigger gadget made of multiple copies of this small gadget. But this bigger gadget inherits the properties from the small gadget. And the properties are, so, 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 so consider this gadget to be kind of a super node. You'll see in a minute why I'm using that phrase, super node, or meta node, or whatever you want to think about it. But it has a max degree of four. How do we know we can count the degrees? It's nowhere greater than four. They're connected by the edges, and each gadget has the edge degree there at a quarter of two, so two connected by the degree of four. Uh, it's three colorable, but not two colorable. How? We know because well, each gadget is three colorable, so connection a bunch of gadgets by the end point is also three colorable. It's not two colorable because it's not got lots of triangles. No triangle is two colorable, much less you know, anything larger than that. And finally, many three coloring, all corners now must get the same color. By corner, we mean all the tips, the remaining tips. This one, this one, this one, this one, and that one all must get the same color. How many understand that or believe that? Okay, why is that? Why do, no matter how many copies we put together, end to end, if you see color, the entire ensemble of copies, all the corners must all have the same color. How is that inherited from the single gadget instance? Not a trick question, straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, in each gadget, the three corners must be the same color, but these, this gadget and that gadget overlap by a corner, so that gadget and that gadget must have that corner in common, and each one must have the other corners in common with that corner, so all the corners constraints propagate out across this entire sequence of gadgets all connected end to end. How do you see that? Yeah. So now we have a larger gadget that has more corners. You've seen in a minute why we're doing this. So far, it's a bit of a mystery, I agree. I'm just laying down the properties so that we can exploit them properly. So now we're going to use the super gadgets and super nodes as fat out components to reduce the degree of a graph. Okay. So what does that mean? Let's say we have a graph that has some node with a higher degree than 4. In this case, say degree 5. Um, and this is just a piece of a graph. There's other things connected. It could be a very large graph. But let's just focus on this node with high degree, higher than 4. I'm going to replace that node with this super gadget in a way that preserves the three colorability of the surgically manipulated graph. In other words, if the original graph is three colorable, it's three colorable even only if this new graph, which is surgical replacement of this node by a gadget, will be three colorable also. Let me show you how to do it. So take this node, here are the five edges coming into it. One, two, three, four, five, here are these five edges. The remainder of the graph I'm leaving intact. I'm not changing the remainder of the graph. I'm just focusing on this node, doing a local replacement. I'm replacing that node locally, not globally connected to anything else. Its neighbors stay the same. But instead of that one node, I'm kind of zooming in on that node. Instead of having that single node here with the five edges going into it, guess what I'll do? I'll put a gadget in there, just like that. This big gadget will replace this node. 
how you see this replacement happening good. Now, why did I do that? Because if I'm going to, but now, not, first of all, let's, let's see what I did. I replaced that node with a gadget, which means the degree everywhere inside here is at, is at most four now. Why? Because I only connected these external edges that came into that node to the, to the endpoints, to the exterior points of the gadget, which had degree two to begin with. Every node on the exterior, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one, all have degree two. So if I connect an external node to it, the degree goes to three, and the degree everywhere else in the gadget remains the same, because I'm not modifying and connecting anything to the internal pieces of the gadget, just to these endpoints. So the degree is at most four, not five anymore, in the neighborhood of this node. And I can do this replacement for every node that has a degree higher than four. I can do this local replacement. I may need larger and larger gadgets. This gadget has three copies. But if a node has degree, I don't know, 17, I'm going to need uh, you know, 15 of these gadgets, all strung together into a super gadget to do the local replacement for a node of degree 17. How many see that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm reducing the degree of the graph to at most four by doing these local replacements of nodes of higher degrees than four. So local replacements. But more than that, the resulting graph, after all these local replacements, is three colorable if and only if the original unmodified graph is also three colorable. How many can see that? Why? Because in, before I made the replacement, all these five edges here come in and see a single node with a single color as far as constraints go. Here, they come into this gadget and they all see exactly the same color internally here because all the endpoints of the gadget must have the same color. We already proved that. So they behave as a single node with respect to outside colorability constraints interacting with that local group. I mean, understand this trick. So this Jedi trick is, is the key to this whole proof. So replacing nodes of higher degree with these gadgets that preserve colorability constraints. Same as individual nodes would. But the degree now is much lower of this new graph with these local replacements. And that's pretty much the proof that colorability of degree max four graphs is as hard as arbitrary degree graphs. Why? Because you can always use these local replacements. That's a transformation. That's a reduction of one to the other. How many understand this whole thing end to end? And it's maybe quarter of the class, okay. How many understand what we're trying to prove to begin with? Never mind how, okay. About half the class, I'll take it. How many here are you listening to okay. Don't answer that. Something you probably don't want to know. Uh, so again, what have we done? We're trying to prove that maximum four color abilities is as hard as any color of those guys. How do we do that? Well, by taking Higher degrees, reducing them to lower degrees in a way that preserves colorability constraints. In such a way that the resulting graph, after all these local replacements of high degree nodes by these gadgets, would be three colorable if and only if the original graph, the graph was three colorable. Okay. So if you have a solver, a fast solver for max degree four colorability, all you can do is tell the colorability yes, no for max degree four graphs. For any higher degree graphs, it will choke. It will fail. It will, it, will, it will crash. It will not answer. Well, you can exploit this solver, limited though it may seem, into solving any degree color going for you by converting it to this kind of low degree graph first, and then feeding those graphs to this solver that can only handle max degree four graphs. And if you can do its work job efficiently, you can solve any graph color going efficiently. Because this transformation is very fast. How fast is this transformation in terms of the size of the graph. I have a graph of size n, and I want to make all these local replacements. How big is the new graph? First of all, how many say the new graph would be bigger than the old graph? You're replacing individual nodes by groups of them. Okay, how much bigger? Big O of what? Because n nodes in the original graph, n nodes of edges. How big is the resulting graph after all these substitutions? Local replacements. 
B goes on N. I mean, it's linear time transformation. Right? Sure. Because then you know it gets replaced by, you know, as many of these groups in the gadget that, as, there, as there are edges. But it's only a constant per edge. Right? So it only increases the size of the graph linearly. And even if it didn't quadratically increase the size of the graph, that's okay too. I just want you to see that it's not even quadratic, it's linear, even though it would be okay if it was n to the fifth. But it isn't, it's linear. It's a pretty straightforward, fast transformation. Any questions about this? So, so this proves that graph coloring is hard, but not because of the degree. It's hard even for limited degree, four limited. Max to be four. That's still hard. It's still NP. <coughs> so, so in a sense, we've, we've reduced all of NP to max to be four graph colorability. Three colorability of max to be four graphs. That's as hard as any problem with NP. Amazing. So it's not about the degree. It's something about colorability that's hard beyond just a fixed degree. It's just difficult even for a small fixed degree. So let me show you an example of you know, how, how, how this might work. Here's a graph with one node has degree 6 and one node has degree uh, 5 here. So just so you can see exactly these transformations, how it works. So I'm going to copy the graph here. And we're going to focus on this node here that has degree 6. And this node that has degree 6 will be replaced by a gadget. So I'm going to take the node away. And instead, put the gadget in here. It's a little warped, so it fits in the circle. It doesn't matter if it's warped. Graphs are topological, not geometric. Right. And now I'm going to take these edges connected to that node and connect them to the ends of the gadget, like this. Fun with PowerPoint. It's, uh, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta have fun doing something on weekends, and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, PowerPoint is my hobby. Well, not a server, but still. So now all these nodes are on the outside connected to the end of the gadget, and that's a replacement there. And I do the same thing for this other node that has max degree, here it has degree 5, I'm going to make it max degree 4, how? By replacing that node with a gadget, and all these edges are connected to the ends of the gadget, preserving the colorability constraints that go with it. Bottom line is this original graph becomes this new modified graph here. This has max degree 6, which will be even higher. This has max degree 4 no matter what. And then I feed that to my max degree 4 set of colorability solver for 3 colorability. And that will tell me what's going on with this colorability on any graph of any degree. That's an example of what we did on the previous slide, showing exactly how you do the substitutions. And this is a general construction. Um, how many understand that now? Okay, good. More than half the class. And they win. That's good. It's a good one. Um, and this transformation is pretty straightforward. It works in all cases. And now you have a maximum four color really so that you can do any colorability solutions for any graph. Bottom line is the problem is empty complete, even if the degree is restricted to be four. Any questions about any of that? And why is it four? Why didn't we go for three or two? Or or one or zero degree. Well, because those are easy. Those are obviously straightforward algorithms like we discussed 10 minutes ago. You can solve that either trivially or looking for odd cycles or whatever. So, so four is, is a threshold of where the degree max limit explodes into full bloom and completeness. Not at one, not at two, and not even at three. Although for extra credit, tell me exactly what why three is. Is not empty complete. Because if 3 was empty complete, we'd prove that instead of 4. Okay. So, colorability is hard. Um, and you might say, okay, well, so the degree you know, doesn't matter. It's hard no matter what the fixed, constant, the bounded degree is. What about planarity? Because I already mentioned you planar graphs earlier, which is insightful. Now we're going to talk about planar graphs. It turns out for planar graphs, it's still empty complete. The planar graphs are a very small, special category of graphs. Graphs that have been drawing the plane without any edges crossing. Without any two edges crossing. Question? Uh, the, the 
visit with the degree of both like export but is that a function of colorability as well is it a four max degree graph four color ah so in saying uh, so we proved that three colorability of degree four graphs or max degree four graphs is empty complete. So he's saying, what about four colorability of max degree four graphs? Is that empty complete? And we say, yeah, that's empty complete too. And we say, no, that's easy. Nobody's having an opinion. That must be a good question. Nobody can say yes or no to that question. Uh, the short answer is it's also empty complete. If you keep increasing the degree, It gets harder, not easier. If you get more color options, does it get easier? Uh, if you get more color options, uh, in general, no. Why? Prove to me that even if you, if you ask the question of general graphs, whether a general graph is 17 colorable or not, why is it not easy all of a sudden? For arbitrary graphs. Very good question. Can anybody think of a proof why asking the question whether a graph is 17 color then, that's still empty complete? So I'll give you I'll give you a hint. One common trick you can pull. Let's say you have a you have a graph, and you know it's you're trying to determine if it's if it's 17 color, and let's say it's hard to determine, and you know you know it's it's not 18 color. Well, let's put that way. You know it's 18 colorable, but you don't know if it's 17 colorable. One thing you could do is you could take your graph and also take a 17 click in addition to the graph and then feed it to a solver. The 17 click is not going to be any less than 17 colorable. But you can ask these kind of questions of a, of a, of a solver. And, and determine the threshold of colorability by deliberately adding pieces to this graph that are not k colorable for some k, and to see if the colorability breaks down because of that piece or, or not because of that piece. So that's one one thing we can do. But generally, let's just say the higher the constraint, uh, in general, the more difficult it is to to determine. And the lower the constraint, maybe you can play some tricks and have some bounded number of choices, or, or in the case of constraint 0, 1, and 2, the algorithms will actually trivialize to whether it's chains and odd cycles or have edges or no edges in the case of 1 and 0. Um, so in general, the higher, the more general the constraints, the more difficult the question becomes. Because the ones with Restric restricted constraints is a special case of the general case. Right. Uh, so if you have no constraint, you know, um, yeah, so uh, we should probably leave it at that for now. Yeah. Is a n degree graph always n colorable? Yeah, yeah. An n degree graph is saying is always n colorable. Sure, because you can paint all the nodes different colors, one to n, and it doesn't matter what the edges are. No to no share color is all in different colors. So yeah. So, so when you increase the constraint, you know, to high enough, well, if you remove all the constraints at all, uh, and you ask if a graph is n colorable, it becomes trivial again. Simply because you can paint every node in different color. Um, but if you make make it you know a smaller threshold, it's not so obvious how to pull it off if it's possible. Yeah. A triangle is a two degree graph, but it is not two color. Um, a, a triangle is a max degree two graph, but it's not two colorable, but it is three colorable. It requires a third color because it's an odd cycle. Yeah, so means the statement is a bit. 
Well, so for special cases, uh, you can kind of reason it out and if the, degree, if the, if the constraints, not necessarily just the degree or, other, uh, or just the, um, the, the number of colors. Generally, if you restrict the parameter of the problem to be a very small range, the problem gets easier, not harder. Or, you know, um, in general, there's probably some counter examples of that, but that's a general trend. Okay, well, let's talk about planar graphs. So, if a, a graph is planar if and only if it can be painted in the plane, put all the nodes in the plane, and all the edges can be put also there, such that no two edges cross. That's a planar graph. So, this graph is, is planar. Um, so, we're going to show that it's NP complete whether uh, a planar graph is recoverable or not. So, it's not about planarity either. And planar graphs, by the way, are a very, very special case of graphs. Um, in a planar graph, you can only have linear number of edges, not quadratic. In general, you can have quadratic number of edges. You have all the nodes connected to all other nodes. That's n shoes to nodes, which is n squared nodes, to the n squared edges and n nodes. Um, so the number of edges can work quadratically in the number of uh, nodes. The planar graphs, they both go linear with one another. So that, that's already a huge constraint on the types of graphs that are planar versus not planar. So we're going to use a planarity-preserving gadget. So the, the, the essence of the proof is similar to the previous proof. We're going to do local replacements by gadgets in a way that preserves colorability. So now it's a little bit more involved than before, because we have to properly respect planarity, not just you know, the, the, um, the degrees. So the gadget is planar. Why? Right? Here's a pla planar embedding of the gadget, where no two edges cross, obviously. It's three colorable. Uh, how do we know that? Well, because here's a three color of it. Valid through coloring of it. So this gadget is planar and is through colorable. And in any through coloring, opposite corners get the same color. So whatever this color is, it will be the same as that color. And separately, whatever the uh, leftmost color is, it will be the rightmost color on the other end, independently of the first pair. And this requires proof, that's not obvious. So, first we notice that whatever you paint the original center. Let's call it red arbitrarily with almost in generality. Its two neighbors over here will be the other two colors. So color one, color two, and color three. And then you can start having constraint propagation of colorability. Remember that diamond that constrains the two ends of the diamond, top and bottom, to be the same color from a couple of slides ago. Well, there's a lot of that going on here. How do we know? Well, here's a diamond here. And this diamond here. Right? So this color propagates down here because of this diamond. How many can see that there's a diamond here that looks like that? Even though it's a little bit skewed, that's fine. So it's topological, not geometric. So these colors propagate out. So whatever you paint this color with, that will enforce. There's two choices now. What we're going to do is bifurcate into two choices where this is green or this is red. If this is green, this guy is constrained to be red by these two neighbors, right? And then this guy is constrained to be blue by these two neighbors, right? And so on. And all the colors begin to propagate around in a forced way. And right? the two neighbors force their neighbor to be the third color other than themselves, because that's what colorability is about. And you have this bunch of forced choices now, but the point is that whatever color this was green, this will acquire the green color as well by all these propagation of constraints. Not only that, whatever color this was, blue in this case, this will become blue as well by a similar propagation of constraints all the way around. And finally, this one will be red. So the other case is if this was painted red, not green, that was the alternative case, and you'll have a similar propagation of constraints there. If you follow the constraints, so everything is automatically forced to be painted these following colors. And you can have, but the bottom line is that this end and that end, end must have the same color. And separately, this end and that end must have the same color. And it, and, and it can both all be the same as each other, all four of them, but that's a special case. But generally, this configuration propagates this color all the way out to here. How many can see that? Okay. Pretty straightforward. And that will be the gadget for substitution, for local replacement that we'll do in arbitrary graphs. And notice that so opposite sides are independent. So this color is the same as that color. Separately, this color is the same as that color. 
And they can all be in the same color, you know, but they can be also different pairs of colors. So you have this kind of independence of opposite pairs, which are the same as each other, but independent of the other opposite pair, which is the same as each other for the opposite pair. We'll see in a minute why that's important. Once you wrap your mind around this gadget, you're going to use it now to do local replacements. And here's how we're going to use it. So I'm going to basically eliminate edge intersections in the non planar graph using this gadget to preserve colorability constraints. So let's say I have this non planar graph. And by the way, this graph happens to be technically planar. I'm just drawing it in a non planar way. How many see the difference? I mean, I mean, you can see that this is actually a planar graph if I chose to draw it differently. Yeah. How would it be planar if I chose to draw it differently? Yeah, I take this line, this edge, edge here, and just draw it the long way around instead of cut. But let's just keep it this way. We'll see in a minute why it doesn't matter. Some graphs you can't do this. You know, no matter how you redraw the edges, it's not going to make it plain. All right, so we have two problems of crossing edges right there and right there. And we're going to use local replacement in this gadget to handle these cases, these edged crossings there. And what I'm going to do is replace those crossings by these gadgets. So I'm going to focus on these two locations here and replace them by this gadget, each one of these edge crossings by a gadget, and then reconnect the nodes. Instead of connecting across the gadget, I'm going to connect it to the endpoints of the gadget. So this neighbor here is going to connect to this endpoint of the gadget, and the other endpoint is going to connect to the other endpoint using diamonds. Right? So I'm going to connect the gadgets up by the diamonds. Why diamonds? Because diamonds preserve the colorability across the tips of the diamonds. So whatever that color is, this must be the same color across the diamond. So by connecting things with diamonds, I'm preserving the colors if you were to three-color the whole thing, the diamonds will be three-colored properly, and the constraints, more important, will be propagated out in the same way as if I didn't replace them with diamonds and gadgets. I mean, understand that strategy. Yeah. So this is a brilliant way of handling edge crossings by eliminating the edge crossings and instead connecting them with diamonds to their original neighbors, replacing each crossing with a, with a gadget. And once I do that, this new modified surgically manipulated graph with all these gadgets and diamonds replaced is three colorable, even only if the original was three colorable. Except now it's planar. The original one was not necessarily planar. So if I had a subroutine that can return three colorability for planar graphs and planar graphs only, I can exploit that poor thing into determining colorability for any arbitrary graph without it even suspecting that we're exploiting it to do much harder job by first converting a non-planar graph into a planar graph with three color relief and only if the original one is, and then using this solver for planar graphs, and it's doing the general job for us now through this transformation. And that's why colorability of planar graphs is as complete. It's as hard as colorizing any graph of arbitrary structure, non-planar. How do I understand this? Group? Okay, straightforward. Well, once you have the gadget, it's straightforward. I mean, imagine what it took for somebody to concoct this gadget and come up with its properties. You know, that took a lot of rainy afternoons to you know, scratch your head and try hundreds of things that didn't work until he, somebody, that somebody found something that did work and preserved colorability through this local transformation, preserving finality. That's that's clever. That's not trivial. Yeah. Why can't this gadget be another diamond and it's a matrix? Ah, why can't this gadget be just a diamond and make it a whole lot simpler? Because it's not enough. Uh, some of the constraints will be lost and not preserved, and the it won't be an if and only if anymore. And you, you can try to experiment with smaller gadgets or simpler gadgets or just a diamond. You'll see that you're losing the equivalent constraint propagation of the colors. You'll end up with some graph, sure enough, but you'll lose the property that the graph you'll end up with is three color relief and only if the original is three color relief. It won't be an if and only if anymore. And it has to be an if and only if. How many understand that? But that's a good question. Put another way, if there was a simpler gadget that works, I'd be showing that to you instead. 
and it's more complicated. Because it's much more complicated gadgets that work too. But that's the simplest known gadget that does this job. And people have looked really hard for simpler gadgets or, or, or an alternate proof altogether, rather than new gadgets. Okay, so and that's, and that's how you do it. That's how you solve general colorability with planar only graph colorability. Sovereignty. So, with graph coverability for planar graphs, all of a sudden you get some efficient algorithm for that, for normal time algorithm. Immediately, you have a normal time algorithm for arbitrary colorability and for all of NP. So, uh, so, it's not about planarity, and, and obviously, it's not about maximum degree being four. So, the next question is you know, what about? Max degree four and planar at the same time. Throw both constraints onto a graph. Make sure it's planar. Make sure it's max degree four. Because with these graphs here, it's not max degree four. And we can see that the, the degree could be much higher than four once you do this transformation. I mean, it's five right here. It's not even four here. And here, it could be five, or it could be six, or ten, or twenty. Whatever the degree here was, that would be the degree there. So it's not max degree four. But in this way, the previous uh, uh, proof or you know, gadget replacement strategy was back to before, but not necessarily planar. What if it's both? What if you're going to have to be both planar and max to be four? That's, that's a, you know, each one is a big constraint. Put it together, maybe the problem is not easy. Turns out it's still everything. It's max to be four and planar at the same time. What do you think the proof would be? Take a wild guess. Yeah, putting both schemes for replacement simultaneously on top of each other. So let's, let's you know, show it to you by example. Let's say I have this uh, max degree, uh, excuse me, I have non planar graph as it's crossing. So I do this transformation. Okay. So I do this transformation that we just saw, and now the, the, the graph is planar. But it's planar, but the degree is higher than 4. Here the degree is 5. And it could be other, here the degree is 5 also. Right? Here the degree is 5. The degrees could be even higher than that. Now I'm going to do the other transformation, the other local replacement from the previous proof from five slides ago, and replace each higher degree, five, higher degree than 4 with this other gadget that looks like this. And I'm going to keep doing it. I've got to do it in other places. I'm not going to show it all because there's one here, and there's one here, and you know, there's one there, and there's one there. So then you start getting messy. But I can pull the second, the original transformation on top of this last transformation. And now I have a graph that's both planar and max degree 4. And testing for its recoverability there is as hard as testing for arbitrary colorability and arbitrary graphs by the same kind of reason. How many understand that? Three. Okay. So you can compose these reductions. All we did is compose two reductions. It's a composition of two reductions, one on top of the other. Could you have done it the other way around? I'll let you think about that. Did I first replace, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, maximum four gadgets and then worry about edges crossings? How do you say yeah, I could compose them the other the other way too? I say you might run into some issues. What what you, what issue might you run into? The change graph that you put on the intersection. Yeah, once you do this, and then you know it it, it may it may ruin the planarity. You know, so you have to be careful. You can't just compose things any old which way. You have to be a little careful. Okay, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, and you have to do this replacement in these other places. I'm just not showing you anything because it will just get messy. I just showed you one replacement. Uh, by the way, how fast is this transformation? If there's a graph of uh, end nodes and edges total, what's the resulting graph size? Oh, and I mean, see linear, not really increasing its size as sympathetically by anything. And if you did, it'd still be okay if it was quadratic or cubic. It'd still be okay, but it isn't necessary to increase its size. Just so you know. Um, so, a little more about graph colorability in general. So, planar graph one colorability is trivial because uh, a, a graph is one colorability only if it has no edges. I really, really mentioned that. Planar graph two colorability is, is not completely trivial, but it's, it's easy. It's, a graph is planar, and a planar graph is two colorable, even only if it's just at most pairs of edges, but not uh, 
uh, add cycles. I guess chains are okay too, not just pairs, but chains, but not cycles unless they're even cycles, in which case two colors are, are sufficient to paint an even cycle, but an odd cycle requires three colors, so I don't understand that. So that's relatively straightforward, you can determine that condition quickly. But when the planar graphs are three colorable, that's empty complete. Why? Well, we just proved previous slide, previous two slides. But here's, here's an interesting situation. Planar graph for colorability is trivial again. So that goes back to the question you raised earlier. Why? Because every planar graph can be painted with at most four colors. That's a known mathematical theorem. Uh, it was open for centuries, for a couple of centuries, since the 1800s. And finally, in 1975 or so, two guys, Apple and Hicken, finally proved that four colors suffice to paint any planar graph. How many have heard of that result? Or, okay, good. It's a famous result. Uh, major, major math open problem, open for 150 or so years, beginning in 1852, and then finally they, they solved it in the 70s. Um, interesting thing about this proof, even though they, they proved it, that four colors suffice to paint any planar graph, uh, that proof required almost 2,000 special cases. Analysis of 2,000 special cases. Each one had to be proven as separately established as a lemma before they. So the, the proof was hundreds of pages long, maybe thousands of pages long, actually. And it was proved on by computer because there's no way a human could analyze all these cases and show that there's no other cases but the sizes, you know, almost 2,000 cases. It was one of the earliest proofs that were done by computer and took another computer program to verify. And some mathematicians actually, on, on principle, object to these kind of proofs. They can only be understood second order, second hand, via the program that checks it. The program can always have but. And the program can say, yeah, I checked this proof. It's working. It's working. Don't worry about it. Well, you can scratch your head and say, well, what if the program has a bug in it and just reported a false positive on the correctness of the theorem that you checked mechanically? Um, it can get even worse. You can have a program that writes a program that proves the theorem, not just a program that proves the theorem. So if you're arbitrarily far away from first-hand knowledge of human understanding. Of course, there's also proofs constructed by humans. There are so many hundreds of pages long that only, like, say, six, six people on the planet are capable of understanding that proof. Like Fermat's last conjecture that became Fermat's last theorem, proved by Andrew Wiles in 1993, finally, after three and a half centuries of being open, there's only a handful of people on the planet that understand all 400 pages of that proof. And we all take their word for it. That's true. So, so already, most of what we know is already second-hand knowledge, based on the word of famous mathematicians that we don't trust that verifies it. Verifies it and, uh, and this problem was so famous that the U.S. Post Office had this stamp cancellation uh, method back in 1976 when this first came out as a proof, and it said four colors of five. So official stamp by the U.S. government must be true. There were no fake news back then. So, uh, okay, so uh, another interesting theorem is fi finding uh, a planar, so just because we know from that theorem that a, that a four coloring exists for planar graph doesn't mean it's easy to find. And you can find a four coloring for a planar graph in quadratic time, in deterministic quadratic time. And you can find a five coloring for a planar graph in linear time. But that, that's sort of the best we can do so far. That we know. So, so we know these colorings exist, four colorings exist for planar The theorem tells us that. But actually finding it is not trivial it to take quadratic time for a four color, even though we know it's there. Okay. Uh, testing for planarity, though, you can do it in linear time. I give you a graph, you tell me if it's planar or not. You can do that in linear time. It's a famous algorithm by Lipton and Tarjan from the 1970s. But that's not trivial, it's a complicated algorithm, even though it works in linear time. For a while, it was an open question whether planarity testing can be done in linear time, and it can. It's, it's hard to do. It's a complicated algorithm. Uh, for coloring, a three colorable graph is LP hard. So, that's an even more interesting thing, because even if you know a graph, it's three colors. I give you a graph, I, I tell you it's three colors, for sure. And I'm asking you not even for a three color, I'm asking for a four color of that three color graph. 
That's still in design. That's still hard to do. We don't know how to do that efficiently. But we know, for example, that at a torus, seven colors are both necessary and sufficient. So if the manifold, if the surface is not a plane, but a more complicated surface, like a torus or a double torus, right? it looks like a donut, that's where the torus is, four colors no longer suffice, like in a plane. So here's an example where you need seven colors. If you take this parallelogram and fold it on itself like a cylinder, you know, this, ed this edge will become this edge, it's a, it's a cylinder, and then you connect two opposite edges to get this torus, you see that four colors are necessary and sufficient for this configuration. Another way of saying it is if you take this square and you fold opposite sides oppositely uh, together, uh, each color is a neighbor of six other colors, which means you need seven colors. Seven colors are both necessary and sufficient out of torus. Uh, topologically, a torus is the same as a cup, you know, interestingly. Uh, you know, topology is uh, the field of mathematics that uh, is concerned with the global properties of a, of a, surf of a surface more generally called manifold. They have very strange manifolds like Klein bottles and Mobius strips and projective planes. How many even know what these things are? I mean, put, put a bunch of them, extra, or power two. And in general, for if you have a surface of uh, genus uh, G, G is a number of holes like a door, torus or a double torus, two, tor two tori or toruses connected together, welded together, or three or four, like a big chain. Uh, the number of colors are both necessary and sufficient grows as the square roughly of the genus. More specifically, it's exactly this quantity here. So if you have a, uh, you know, a, a, a quadruple torus, 10 colors are necessary and sufficient. Of course, the torus, if the genus is zero, we have a plane. So four colors are necessary and sufficient. We already talked about that. So in general, you have these more generalized results. Now the color grows as a square of the number of holes in the surface. Interestingly. That we know, that's proven, that's a fit of uh, so application of graph color, there's lots and lots of applications of graph color in ways that you don't even expect. So for example, if you want to assign jobs to time slots and do scheduling to avoid conflicts on a shared resource, you, know, you want to model jobs as nodes and conflicts as edges. So for example, let's say you have five jobs and they're related like this. In other words, you know, any pair of jobs that have an edge between them share some common kind of resource that they cannot collide on. Uh, both to trying to access and register a computer, both have jobs or threads or, or processes. So you cannot execute things simultaneously that share a resource. Let's say one job is trying to print, and the other one wants to print. Also, there's only one printer, so both have to wait. These are mutually exclusion, mutual exclusion kind of uh, constraints, these edges. So how do you schedule these jobs? Well, it's, it's graph color. Right? So for example, if you paint uh, if you, if you three, three, three color this graph, you come up and say this scheme of three color this graph. That means job one and three can execute simultaneously. Job five and two can execute simultaneously, and job four can execute by itself. And so you get this schedule of execution. You have number four going first, and then number five and two in parallel, and then one and three in parallel, because they don't conflict among each other, those that are running in parallel. So the, the chromatic number of this graph, the minimum number of colors necessary to paint this graph, is also the number of time slots that you need to maximize your parallelism on this set of tasks or jobs. How many get this? Okay. So graph coloring comes up in all sorts of interesting scenarios that you don't even expect. So you try to do scheduling, you're doing graph coloring in disguise. So that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, graph coloring is such a ubiquitous important problem, just like SAT, just like you know, all these other computer problems, They're all equivalent to one another. Okay. In the CPU, a compiler has to do graph coloring. Why? Because it has to register, uh, allocate registers inside the CPU. Arithmetic expressions you know, that use the same register cannot execute in parallel, even if you have multiple cores or highly parallel pipeline microprocessor, because there will be clashes on the register. One's three trying to read, one's trying to write from the very same register. That does create hazards or race conditions. Not a good thing when you design the hardware. So again, you know, the variables um, represents uh, registers that can be uh, conflicted or not conflicted with each other via you know, some expressions. 
And then you can use register one on thread one and three. You can use register two for threads two and five because they don't conflict, and register three only for thread four. And this will minimize the number of registers you, you, your compiler is allocating given the hardware you know, constraints. Uh, so your compiler, when you run it, trying to optimize the machine code, the execution, whether for pipeline kind of execution or multi-thread execution, needs to solve graph coloring. That's to find the minimum chromatic number of a graph that represents all the constraints of you know, these regular these uh, regular expressions of the multi-threaded operations. So I'm just wanting you to appreciate that graph coloring and chromatic numbers, which is at least other colors necessary for the graph, that's what chromatic number is, um, happen all the time. You know, every time you run a piece of code, you invoke the compiler, graph coloring gets solved over and over again under the hood. Now you know. So it happens, it happens a lot. Uh, any questions about any of that? This cartoon kind of thinks a funny situation involving graph coloring in a social setting. Uh, your mileage will vary. Uh, so, uh, you know, P and NP, uh, there's a whole lot to it. Um, there's a whole lot outside it. And uh, you know, I can't imagine how long it took me to come up with this slide here and all the animation involved. But that was a weekend where I spent. Uh, any questions about any of this? Graph coloring, transformations, reducing the parameters of a problem, trying to make it easy, see where NP completeness explodes, at what parameter level, one, two, three, four, or higher. Um, it, it takes all, all kinds, you know, there's all possible flavors of these things. Some problems, no matter how low you reduce the parameter, it's still very, very high. Some problems, if you increase the parameters, you know, it's, it's NP complete at all levels. You know, some talk about the parameter is some weird thing like 12 or, or 17, although that's more there. You know, here is some example where the parameter was 4 with respect to degree. That's when it exploded into the end complete. But before that, you know, it, was, it was relatively easy to ascertain. Um, but you can't make general rules. Uh, generally, it's, it's tricky business to, to you know, each thing has to be proved, proven separately and you can't extrapolate easily from one problem to another. What the parameter would be, what the thresholds are, complexity, you know, that makes it easy or hard. It's, it's very problem dependent. Also, approximation schemes. You know, we're going to come up with approximation algorithms uh, such that um, we got. You know, beginning next time, we'll show heuristics or approximations are provably good. We can show that even though a problem is empty complete, you can solve it to within, say, a factor of two of optimal very quickly, in a linear, most quadratic time, and have solutions are guaranteed to be good, with mathematical guarantee, no more than say twice optimal, in terms of say, traveling with salesman to it, or the maximum edges across a cup in the graph, or the number of colors needed to paint something. So even though the exact number we'll never know because it's actually complete, that doesn't mean you can't solve it to within a factor of two or a factor of one and a half or some, some bound, away from optimal guarantee within polynomial time, because you can, and you'll show it how. So, uh, in other words, you know, when it comes to execution speed versus solution quality, ideally, you want an algorithm that's fast and exact. You do exact solution and does it quickly. So, for example, sorting. You know, the short and sweet algorithm for sorting, like merge sort, or you know, um, heap sort that works very, very fast, and, and they give you the exact answer. Um, and sometimes um, the exact answer requires a lot of work. Like, do you want the exact answer for coloring, colorability, or for satisfiability, or for travel and salesman? We don't know how to do it fast, but you can do it slowly but surely. It'll just take a long time, but you will get the exact answer after enough centuries or millennia of computation. Now, in practice, we don't want to wait centuries or millennia for something to compute. We want an answer today or at most tomorrow. So you want approximation algorithms that are quick and dirty and uh, give you a solution quickly, not necessarily the best solution, but a solution that's good enough. Good enough for you to do your job with the living of packages, your FedEx, trying to find a travel with salesman to through the city to your destination. And of course, the problems are so hard that even approximating them will take forever. You'll get your answer, it'll be too little, too late. And we won't bother so much with those, although they exist too. 
So the next, the next lecture will focus on this quadrant here of the solution space. We'll come up with fast algorithms and give you pretty good answers, approximate answers, but are provably good. But at least you have a guarantee that they're no worse than twice the best you can do, even though the best is under the moon. And those will work in linear time or, or you know, very, very quickly. And those are very useful. I've written many papers on, on this stuff. And, and it's extremely practical. Any questions about any of this? All right. See you next time. Thank you.